Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with James Ocheno, Chair of the Board of Palo Alto University. James has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, James, for joining us today. Yeah, welcome, thank you. So Chair of the Board of Palo Alto University, you're not a psychologist, although... I'm not a practicing psychologist. Arguably, you are a person who has dealt with the psychology of, of hiring and of business and of, of, of nonprofits and so on. Talk about what motivated you to join as the chair of the board of this school that is, grad, that is dedicated to the field of psychology. Okay, I think that's, uh, well, first of all, I've been with uh, Powell Alt University for almost 20 years now. And what motivated me to join Palo Alto University was actually uh, the outgoing president uh, who will be president for another year or so, Dr. Alan Kelvin. I had a meeting with him uh, over lunch because um, one of my colleagues, who was then the chair of the board then, uh, said I was, they could use my services. I said, fine, I might have a little bit of time uh, based on my HP work. Um, I said it jokingly. Uh, that I would be happy to have lunch. And before I knew it, I was on the board. <laughs> uh, so, and I've been on the board uh, ever since. And uh, I've now been chair for about, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, about five and a half years now. And you have a career, you've been, you were with HP for 25 years, yes. retired as, as vice president in, the, in yes. the field of HR, which is why I refer to you being a very, experien very experienced in the psych psycholog uh, psychological uh, pursuits. So talk about how that training, mm -hmm. that professional practice has informed your work at Palo Alto University. Yeah, I, I, I had a great career at HP, uh, and HP was very kind to me, uh, and it was a very different HP at that time. Uh, and, and HP recruited me from college, and I told them point blank when they recruited me that I only spent about a couple of years there, that obviously uh, 25 years later I was still there. And uh, great career, lots of uh, adventure, lots of projects. And even though my title says HR, a lot of things that I did, um, in fact, was in mergers and acquisitions. I participated in over 70 uh, mergers and acquisitions at HP. I led the HR team and due diligence in those in participating there, and spent most of my time with fin financiers, investment uh, bankers, and legal team. Uh, and so I honed my negotiating skills during that process, and I negotiated a lot of contracts for the executives because I managed the executive team in equity. So in the process of doing that, uh, my economics and psychology background came into play because uh, that was necessary for us to close most of those deals. And then you also dealt with the aftermath of those deals, yes. the, integration the integration of, the, of different cultures and, and shifting cultures. Absolutely. Yeah, we dealt with the integration of the... Of, of the uh, of the various uh, acquisitions, even though the nice term was mergers, we actually we bought those companies. Right. That's right. A, but the nice terms, us just so they can acclimate into it, uh, was mergers. So I dealt with that, and uh, a lot of them, uh, the integration process actually a lot, takes a lot longer than the actual ac acquisition process, because uh, acquisition you're really talking more about numbers. But once the buck passes, now you're talking about integrating the products, the services, and the people into the organization. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to let some of them go because you have redundancies. So uh, you've seen this organization evolve over the last 20 years. Talk about how the culture of this university has been shaped, and in particular, in, in the recent past, how it's made that transition to an undergraduate um, uh, uh, university as well. Yeah. That's, that's, a, a, that's an interesting question and a very good one because uh, the segue from HP to Dr. Alan Kelvin, he was he is, was a very staunch believer in HP and practiced his management style based on the HP way. And so and he believes that uh, if you treat people fairly, then things will happen. And he has used that uh, practice uh, within Palo Alto University. So he has been uh, obviously very enamored by the old HP practice. And so coming from that environment, it was a natural for me to fit in here. Uh, and uh, and in, in, in terms of the, uh, uh, the culture itself, the I, I shifted a little bit of the focus in the culture from a more 
faculty-oriented culture to a student-centered culture uh, because uh, for the most part, a lot of things tended to go through the faculty, and they still do. I value faculty tremendously. I mean, they're the engine of, the, of this university. Right. The, however, if, if we don't have students, uh, there will be no faculty. So the whole issue is, is what is the mission orientation? It's, it, it's not who is important, because everybody's important. Everybody's important. But where is the mission orientation going to be? And what you're saying is that squarely, while it might have been about students before, it is even more about students today. I think, I think it has to be about students today. That is, that is very critical. I mean, our mantra is engaging minds, improving lives. Uh, and uh, that is, that's the first four letters of our mission statement. Because uh, we want to engage the minds and improve lives. We wanted a mantra that uh, uh, showed the behavior and the characteristics of the culture of Palo Alto University. Because we're not just about teaching and educating students. We really want to, for the students to provide get the best experience possible at Palo Alto University, both from a career development and a professional development perspective, and be able to go out there and uh, in, the, in the world and uh, improve lives, use the skill set to improve lives. And you're also about the faculty uh, as well, going sort of back to the f full circle, in that for, for faculty to focus on students, be rewarded and recognized for that focus on students, and thinking about their research in terms of how to engage students and how to mm -hmm. leverage that research, not, not to uh, get soft money, but to actually engage minds and actually improve lives. Yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by this faculty. I'm very impressed. Uh, for a school of our size, and we're not a very big school, and actually not a very old school, uh, but for a school of our size, we have some of the best faculty in the world, bar none, in the field of psychology. We have some of the best known faculty that came from the Stanford and other areas, other well-known schools that are now part of the uh, Palo Alto University faculty. This is a great faculty. What is, is your a, secret for, for attracting such a great faculty? I, because I, you know, I, we're, we're out there talking with people and you are known, you are known. I think we provide them with the tools necessary for them to engage in their research. We provide them with uh, the quality students for them to work with them and have uh, and advise them appropriately. And we provide them with a wide breadth of psychology. We're not just a single discipline uh, within psychology. I mean, we span a tremendous amount of uh, the breadth of psychology, uh, whether it be suicide, ADHD, uh, early learning, smoking, you name it. Uh, but we also op offer opportunities where they can actually engage in improving lives around the world, such as some of the things we did at uh, working with uh, the country of Rwanda and helping them overcome, which you really can't overcome, but you can certainly start moving towards the healing process of the genocide that occurred uh, several 20 plus years ago. Uh, so that's an example. And that type of environment, uh, I think, is very attractive to, uh, uh, to faculty members, particularly when they can come and engage with the students of equality. So, so it's that combination of practicality, ethics, values, um, mission, mm -hmm. um, risk-taking, entrepreneurship mm -hmm. that, that is interesting as part of your DNA. It really is, and, and that's what makes Palo Alto University quite unique. Uh, and we, uh, we obviously want that to continue with a new leadership uh, in 2016, uh, and it's very important. It's an important agreement for Palo Alto University. So I'm looking forward to it continuing because we are well known for being that unique. Um, are there other uh, psychology schools out there on a, from a research standpoint that focus solely on research? Absolutely. Uh, but as you know, we're not a sole research institution. We're not a, we don't, we don't go out and recruit just two students uh, to enter into our PhD program. We actually have about 80 students come here every year because our purpose is to train them and so they can go out in the world and uh, do their bid and improve lives. As the chair of the board, how, and, and as somebody who is so experienced in the field of HR, how do you interview for that X ingredient? <laughs> the, key, the key ingredient for us, uh, be, and, and he asked the question earlier about what also is unique about this institution, why the faculty uh, would like to, uh, why we attract so, such quality faculty. Part of that is we believe strongly in shared governance, whereby all of the, um, uh, all of the constituencies, the faculty, the students, the staff, the trustees, are engaged in decision making. Now, obviously, it, when it becomes a, it's a policy issue, that's the purview of the trustees. But in terms of running the school 
and determine, making some big decisions. Shared governance is critical. So we try to make sure that we have input from all the different constituencies, which is not true of all institutions of higher learning. What we've observed is that everybody gets heard. Everybody has a voice. Yes. Um, and, and those voices are truly respected. It doesn't mean, however, that that decision is stymied um, just because uh, there are outliers with different opinions from the group. Those opinions might be respected, but there seems to be a facility at Palo Alto University to hear, to listen, to adjust, to respect, but that respect is mutual, so that if somebody doesn't get their way, they're also willing to compromise. It is, uh, and it's, it's fascinating because one of the best skills to be a, a really strong psychologist is to ha have the ability to be able to listen. So that implies that you should be able to sit back, listen to what the other is saying, and actively listening, not just hearing what they're saying, right. but you want to really actively listen so you can respond appropriately. Because after all, if you're going to be out there counseling or as a therapist or whatever the case may be, or the research, if you can't listen, then I don't think you'll be a very good psychologist, let alone a good uh, consensus builder. How has the board developed over the last years, and, and where do you wish the board to develop in the future as the organization becomes more uh, weighted toward uh, the undergraduate area without leaving the graduate area behind? There will be more students, an increasing number of the overall student population will be undergraduates. Will, will there be those and other changes that will be reflected in the board? Yes, I, I think there will be changes reflecting the board. Uh, I can speak about the current board uh, and how that board has evolved over the years because I think board, a board mirrors the uh, phases that an, that an institution goes through. Uh, and certainly a board reflects uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the interests uh, and the priorities of the university president. Uh, and so to that extent then, uh, I certainly think that we want to make, ensure that whoever's coming in, whoever the next president will be, will have an opportunity to look at that and be part of the process in shaping the board for the future. Because uh, once you have an understanding of what strategic plan is, then you want to, we want to ensure that you have the right pieces in place, uh, right board members in place with the right skill sets, uh, right, right experiences that can help you move forward uh, to execute in the strategic plan. And what's interesting is that your, your board seems to be shaped to cover a number of different bases. You have the normal oversight of the board and having the appropriate competencies uh, within the board so that they could they could uh, exercise financial oversight, fundraising oversight, and so on and so forth, the various technical skills. But you also have relationships that are incredibly pow uh, powerful and incredibly important with the community college systems, which is from where you, you draw your, um, your uh, undergraduate student population. Mm -hmm. uh, you have relationships with Stanford. Mm -hmm. um, you, your board really does reflect your aspirations going forward. And you're right now at a point where you have enough room so that the new president coming in can influence the board. And that's all deliberate. The board actually has planned for this in preparation for the president to come in. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it, it is very deliberate at this point. And uh, just like to go back to one of the points that you made, uh, which is the uh, our collaboration with Stanford. Uh, that's a very important collaboration because uh, our collaboration with Stanford is in this ID program, which is a, a great program, uh, best in the and it's rather uh, unique. The, yeah, it's very it's rather unique, one of the top five in the in the, in the country. Uh, it's a great program, and uh, our collaboration with Stanford has been working uh, very well. Our board is comprised with. Stanford individuals that understand Stanford individuals that understand uh, how these co collaborations work. Uh, it's a comprise of individuals that fit in all the various pieces where we need, uh, uh, where we will need help. Uh, because even though we serve in the capacity as a board, uh, part of the reason the board is large is that in, in shared governance, uh, we, we invariably we end up in task forces uh, where even though we as a board member were there to represent the formulation and the idea of whatever that task force is doing. We take off our board hat and we put on our shared governance hat and to help with the with, with idea. I mean, we come, maybe coming from it from perspective of a board member, uh, so we're looking at it at a fairly high level, but our intent is to really work on making sure that the idea comes to fruition jointly. And the benefit 
for that, for a new leader, is that that approach, which it permeates the search committee for the, for the new president, it seems to permeate everything that you do. It is bringing people along yes. so that you won't have a situation in which there will be a disruption in which an old leader comes in and everybody then uses that as an opportunity to voice their suppressed discontent. Correct. The discontent is not suppressed. If somebody has an opinion, they express it. The, those expressions are taken into account. And it's the same thing with the search committee. It, mm -hmm. people, people are really actively engaged. They are affecting the process. They can see that they're affecting the process. And that ends up having a lot of buy-in. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And that's and so, I mean, you've witnessed the search committee. Sure. And I mean, you're, you are a facilitator in that. And so, you can see shared governance in action. In other words, you get input. At the end of the day, we end up with a we end up with a bad, good product. Not everybody's input will be. Everybody's input is heard, right. but a decision is then made, and you move forward with everybody understanding that this is the path forward. And we've seen some very passionate yeah. discussions. Very passionate, very passionate discussions, as you yeah. well know. And, very passionate. Uh, but but we seem to see these resolved. It takes a little bit of time, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's time that is well invested, it's, it's respect that is due, uh, opinions are heard, and sometimes when you get beyond the emotion and you actually take a look at the content of, uh, of what might be emotionally expressed, I've seen people say, you know, there's a real point here, we need to change, yeah. and, and that's good to see. It is good to see, it is good to see. And, and as, as we embark on this change, um, I mean, there, there, there are individuals are uh, they're fearful because change brings fear uh, of the change of the unknown. Uh, the uh, Dr. Calvin has uh, been here for well over 30 years. I mean, he's he's the institution, and so there will be some challenges that the new president will face, uh, not insurmountable, uh, but uh, clearly the a number of the uh, uh, the faculty, the staff, uh, it will be a change, and I can understand. Uh, them being a little bit nervous about that. So we'll have to work to ensure and, enga and engage that the environment uh, that the new president c comes in and brings in uh, will be stable enough that they can uh, proceed and move forward. Let's go back to the international programs and, and the scope of your international programs. Could you just discuss the impetus for the international programs and just a range of different activities that are being pursued? The, the impetus is both planned and opportunistic. Uh, planned in the sense that we're living by a mantra of engaging minds, improving lives. So in situations where we know that uh, there are hot spots uh, and the people around the world that need help, as in Rwanda, uh, it's one where you plan and you go and you say, we can help. How can we help? This is how we'll do it and then we'll help with the training aspect of it. Uh, as in um, uh, the typhoon in the Philippines. We, we, we know we have a sense of purpose and can go, and go in there and help. As in the conflict in Northern Ireland, uh, we know we have expertise in conflict resolution, we can go in and we can help. Um, and then some of them are actually opportunistic uh, in situations where we know that uh, there's a growing uh, base of psychology and a growing need for, uh, uh, for a trained uh, uh, therapists, as in China, as in India. Uh, we can we go in there and uh, we partner with the institutions that are looking to grow and we help them. Uh, we move forward and partner with them to ensure that the institutions grow and they can we lend our expertise in that arena because at the end of the day what we're trying to do is make sure that if we have a good product, good services, we want to spread that around the world so others can actually partake of that. And new environments bring new lessons. So yes, you're they do. observing, you're observing, and you're learning, learning from these new environments. Mm -hmm. You're bringing that back to the the university. Certainly, your students benefit from it. You also have a rather brilliant branding strategy, mm -hmm. because as other psychologists come into contact with you, overseas and so on, all of a sudden you become known to these other key leaders in the field. In the field. And, and so there's, there's a really hard-nosed business element here that, that is attached to both the opportunistic and the planned elements of what yes. you're doing. Yes, there is. It, I'm very proud of that, that aspect of it. Um, and, and, and obviously I have to give uh, a lot of credit to uh, 
uh, our provost because he manages and uh, spearheads the uh, provides the leadership for a lot of these global initiatives, um, uh, particularly the ones in Rwanda, the ones in actually in Africa and in Asia. Um, and he's been uh, fairly bullish on making those things happen. So kudos to him. We should also talk about the development of your uh, internet-based education yes. uh, work. Talk about that and the importance of that to Palo Alto University. I think it's still developing uh, as it is in some of the other, uh, in all institutions, it's still developing. We're trying to find what the right balance. But you've been doing this for 15 years. We've been doing it for 15 years. Uh, we started with calling it distance uh, learning. So I mean, we and, and we thought at early stages, we actually thought that we could actually grow it quite a bit more than, than we did. But instead, it's been pretty steady. I mean, we have, uh, we have students in uh, China, students in the Middle East, <laughs> students other places that utilize our distance learning program uh, to, uh, to get a degree in, in psychology. So it's worked out very well. I mean, we started this process well, way before all this, uh, the MOOCs, if you will, and all, all yeah, so we started it well, well before that. Uh, it's worked out well, uh, although platforms have now changed, and so we're looking at the new platforms, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, um, nourish it and uh, improve on it. Uh, and those are some of the challenges that uh, I hope I want our new president to focus on as we move forward. From your perspective in the nonprofit field, what do you think is the most important ingredient to keep a organization like this vital, fresh, refreshed? Because you get to a point in any person's life or in any organization's life where you've had a certain amount of success, you've received recognition, it is so, so enticing to do next year what you did this year because it was successful this year and it was successful last year and at a certain point you, be, you become repetitious, but that is not Palo Alto University's story. No, it's not the Palo Alto University story and, and it requires discipline. Um, and as you said, I've served on a number of, of nonprofits as well as I'm serving on a for-profit uh, startup. And uh, it is very clear that the nonprofits have a passion like no other. But it's also very clear that in general, nonprofits are woefully inefficient. Uh, and the, that's why I'm so proud of Palo Alto University in particular, because there is a passion and there is a fundamental efficiency in the financials. Uh, and it's important to have that balance. And that's one of the things that uh, obviously we're looking to continue, because uh, it's a good thing for the school. And when, when we need to make investments, we'll make investments in the right place. And, uh, but not just for, we don't spend just to, for spending's sake. It has to be purposeful, and we need to strike that balance. So the passion is there. It's ensuring that we continue to nurture that passion and spend wisely as we, as, 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 uh, from an investment perspective. So a focus on being lean, yeah. a focus on being ambitious, yes. a focus on mission, yes. a focus on innovation, yes. and a focus on recreation. If, if it isn't broke, you see what you can actually do better. You can do better. Or the, or the new things that you can do. Yep. And all with the purpose of ensuring that the students have the best and most positive experience in Poway Alto University. So they can expound our mantra and put our engaging minds, improving lives in practice. Engaging minds, improving, improving lives. lives. Put it in practice. James Lucchino, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. For sharing your perspectives on Palo Alto University, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.